Today we move ahead in the second part of this passage in 2 Timothy 2. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to pray for uh, two people in specifics uh, and their families. Let's pray for Jim Nary right now, uh, as he is definitely not doing well. He is in uh, at the VA, and uh, Karen has said that she, he is at the end. So we need to pray for him. Uh, thankfully, he is going to see his Lord and Savior soon. We talked about that uh, just this past week, and he's uh, encouraged by that. So let's pray for him and also Sylvia, uh, uh, Irvin's mom, as she's suffering right now too. Uh, we're not sure of her situation too. So let's pray for both of these people, okay? Before we start our service, Father, we come to you uh, with hearts of uh, sadness uh, and grief for these two, a brother and a sister that are facing uh, very difficult trials right now and are suffering, Lord. We pray for your mercy, your comfort, your grace in their lives and also in their families' lives that are also suffering as they watch their loved ones suffer. We pray for your presence in their life, that they will uh, be reminded of you being with them through this time. We pray that your rod and your staff will comfort them. Uh, Lord, we know that you are a good father and that you are the great comforter so we call out to you for comfort for these two and their families. We thank you that you love us and that you walk with us through these difficult days. We pray that you will be honored and glorified in how we respond to our trials and that we, the body of Christ, will reach out to these families and love them through this difficult time. We love you, Lord. And we ask now that as we look at your word, that you will help us to understand it, that you will help us to apply these truths to our hearts and to live for your glory, obeying your word and bringing great glory to you, for you are worthy. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We are in 2 Timothy 2. 20 to 26. The section actually started back in verse 14 and goes all the way down through 26. Paul has transitioned from uh, enduring to the end in the previous verses to how to deal with those in opposition to the truth. In verses 20 to 26, he develops this concept. One of the biggest problems in the professing church in our country and community is ignorance over the depth of evil of Satan. We are, as a whole, ignorant of just how wicked and deceptive he is. We are limited in our awareness of just how much the devil wants to take each and every one of us down. In our daily Bible reading this week, we spent a day looking at the fall of mankind... In Genesis chapter 3, we saw the enemy took a good thing and twisted it into an opportunity to deceive and cause Adam and Eve to sin. So here's a question for you. Who put the tree of knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? God did. Some might be surprised that that answer, but God's the one that put it there. It's important to notice that the fruit from the trees that Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from was described exactly the same as the fruit of the tree. All the other trees are, are described as the same as the fruit of the trees of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it states this, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree, that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm. And then in Genesis chapter 3, during the temptation, 
Eve evaluated the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she st- it says this about her in Genesis 3, 6. It says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye, pleasing to the sight, and that the tree was able to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate it. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate it. No, don't miss the point. Brenda and I were talking about that this, this week, about how the food God allowed Adam and Eve to eat was exactly the same as the fruit from the trees that they weren't allowed to eat from. Hmm. Both were pleasing to the sight. Both were good-tasting food. And wisdom of good and evil is not a bad thing. Did God have wisdom of good and evil? If God has it, then it's not evil in and of itself. Hmm. What made it evil was eating it if God, the creator, says not to eat it. That's what made it evil. It wasn't the fruit itself. Disobeying God and rejecting his word was what made Adam and Eve sin. That's what sin is. So the tactic of the enemy was to appeal to good desires that were not evil in and of themselves, but because they were not allowed to partake of that specific thing, it was sin in the end. Is looking at a fruit and saying, ooh, that's pleasing to the eye. Is that sin? No. Is it to taste good? Is that sin? No. Is it to have wisdom of good and evil? Is that sin? No. Hmm. So the ploy of the enemy uses the desires, even sometimes the good desires of mankind, to sin against God. He wants us to disobey him. That he wants us to disobey our creator. He will often take things that are not inherently bad in and of themselves, but justify to us having those things at the expense of obeying and honoring God. Satan is ruthlessly wicked. He uses our normal passions and God, even our God-given desires to take us down. The same is true of the false teachers today. All the false teaching today and the teachers themselves. You know, the false teachers often believe that they are promoting what is absolutely fine. They are all in. They think it's fine. Listen, Joel Osteen, I know, I just call him a false teacher. Joel Osteen is not saying, oh, I'm going to plot an evil message today, and I'm going to destroy the world. I actually think he believes that what he's saying is right and good. He's bought the lies. The false teachers in Timothy in Paul's day, Hymenaeus and Philetus, were promoting attractive lies. And Paul was explaining here to Timothy how he and the church were to deal with those in opposition. We need to take serious that the enemy doesn't come at us with, oh, it's easy to see him. He doesn't, he doesn't tempt us with what we hate. He tempts us with what we love. Very, very, very important to note. Last week, We saw what we must do to avoid the deception of the false teachers in this world. First, we must rehearse the doctrine of God's faithfulness. We must rehearse the doctrine of God's faithfulness. Second, we must take serious our responsibility to avoid useless arguments. That's in verse 14. Then in verse 15... We must be diligent to handle the word properly. 
the way God wants us to in verse 15. Then fourth we saw we must avoid the deadly talk of the false teachers. And again, it's deceptive. It looks pretty, but we must avoid it. And finally, we must re remember the stability of God's sovereign work. That those who He knows are His. Knows His. And those that are His will obey Him. Those who call on His name or name His name will seek to put to death wickedness and serve Him. The enduring commitment to obey the Lord is the characteristic of a true believer. So today we continue this section and that explains to us how we should deal with those who are in opposition to the truth. So today we'll look at three more facets that discerning followers of Christ should understand so that we will be protected from the evil ways of the false teachers. These three facets or concepts to understand are given to us so that we will be protected from this deception of the evil one. And it also teaches us how to deal with those that are wrong or in opposition to the truth, teaches us how to instruct or correct or call them out of that situation. There are three facets. First, the illustration in verses 20 and 21. Second, the exhortations in verses 20 to 23. And then finally, the characterization in verses 24 to 26. Let's look at his illustration. Paul's illustration in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 2. The illustration. We start here. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, anyone cleanses, who cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Again, what Paul is doing here is he's giving a word picture or an illustration of how to deal with false teachers, how to discern this environment that we live in, the setting that we live in. Paul uses a large house with household tools as his word picture or the vessels, both the valuable instruments and the disposable instruments or tools. The house with two types of vessels. So what are these word pictures pointing to? What's he illustrating? And what's his, what is he getting at? Well, let's walk down through them and look at them. First, the large house. This is most likely being compared to the professing church. The church at large that Timothy is dealing with there in Ephesus. The large house is the professing church. The gold and silver vessels are the being compared to the true followers of Christ. Those who remember Jesus. Those who are committed to the gospel. Those who are enduring by faith. Those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the gold and silver vessels. And then finally there's the wood and earthen vessels. They're being compared to the false teachers. And possibly some of their followers. Those who, are ultimately, those who are ultimately not saved, but are slowly but surely being revealed as fakes. Those are the earthenware and the wood vessels. It's much like our house today. In our houses, it's like it. You can compare the gold and silver vessels to your silverware. You know what I'm talking about, right? The silverware, when people come over... Like today, we're going to have some people over, and when we have people over, we're not going to use the silverware. We're going to use the wooden earthenware vessels. That would be the plasticware today. And what happens with the plasticware? You throw it out when you're done. Why? So we don't have to wash a bunch of silverware. Makes sense, right? Now when we have a special dinner... And we have people over. Sometimes we bring out the gold and silver vessels. And it's still just fake silver for us. Not real gold. 
But we bring those out and people come over to our house and we put those and we clean them afterwards and we put them away. We hide them sometimes from our kids because they will break them, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? It's the same way. In a large house, you have gold and silver vessels and you have wood and earthenware vessels. Those that are valuable and worthy of honor, used for honor, and those that are used for dishonor. It's the same way with the professing church. You have those that are true believers, genuine believers, and then you have those that are false believers or professing believers that aren't really, truly, genuine believers. They profess, but they're not real. So the final result of these vessels are either glory or destruction, to be honored or to be dishonored. This is just another way of saying what was said back in verses 11 to 13. Look at 2.11, 2 Timothy 2.11 to 13. This is a trustworthy statement, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. That are those that are converted, those that have died with Christ and are alive with Christ. If we endure, we also will reign with him. We will what? Enjoy honor and glory if we endure to the end, trusting in him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That is the dishonorable vessels, those who reject God, those who do not trust in Christ, ultimately, and do not endure to the end. Those are the two types of vessels, just being repeated and illustrated by the Apostle Paul. The true believer who rejects false teaching and the resulting wickedness, will receive honor. And the professing believer who does not really believe and promotes a lie and false teaching will be shown to be not legit. As time goes along, they will be exposed and shown this is not true. They will be denied by the Lord in judgment. Paul then develops those who are honored in the next verse. Look at verse 21, 221. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. I have to admit to you that I grappled with these things for a long time this week. What does he mean by these things? If anyone cleanses himself of these things, well, some said that it was the, the false teachers, cleanses themselves of the false teachers, and others said that it was more of the teaching, the concept of the teaching and their practice of wickedness. I, I guess the best way to say it is, is yes, it's all of that. It's the concept of whatever the false teachers were promoting and their wickedness and all that they were about, we must cleanse ourselves from these things. If we put these things away, if we're intentional about saying no to lies, about saying no to false teaching, not falling into the traps of wrangling about words and getting distracted by all those things. If we say no to those lies, no matter how entertaining and how delightful they may look to the eye, we will survive, and we will be vessels of honor. We will literally be holy vessels, sanctified, set apart, distinct from the world. And we will be able to tell those that are the gold and silver vessels from the earthenware and wood vessels. It will become very clear. The longer I'm in ministry, the more I recognize this. I don't know about you, but all of y'all that have walked with Jesus for a long time, have you seen what I'm talking about? You see this over time. And as time goes along, you see some begin to drift away. You call them back. You say, no, 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 don't go that way. Stay with Christ. He's enough. And they just keep drifting. And you're like, no, 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 come back, please. And yet they drift, and they drift, and they're shown to be vessels of dishonor. The vessels of honor, however, are those that cleanse themselves from the false teaching and from the things of the world, and we are useful to the master. We're useful 
We're set apart, we're sanctified, we're holy, and we're useful to the master. He uses us. The Lord uses even us. Can you believe that? I I have to admit there's an element of here that I don't want to compare myself to a gold or silver vessel. I see myself more as like a wood and earthenware vessel. Anybody else in the room? But The good news is, is that those who God is pouring out His grace upon, we are His gold and silver vessels. He'll get all the credit, doesn't He? Because we know it's only by His grace that we're doing anything good. And we know that we can be useful for the Master. When we kill the lies of the enemy and his wicked temptations, we are useful in the hands of our great God. A vessel of honor is then prepared for every good work. We know this, right, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for... Good works. When God's grace is working in our lives and we are set apart and we've cleansed ourselves from the false teaching of the world, we are then useful. We're prepared for every good work and we can serve one another with joy. We can proclaim the gospel to others. We can stand firm for the truth. When we're thinking right about God and putting off wickedness, then we are prepared to walk in the works of that God has prepared for us before the world even existed. This was Paul's illustration. He uses his picture of a large house. So the natural question is, is which one are you? Which one are you? Are you a gold and silver vessel? Or are you a wood and earthenware vessel? You say, well, I sure look more like an earthenware vessel. I've got good news for you. His name is Jesus Christ. Turn to Him, trust in Him, and He will work in you just as He does in all of His children. He loves us and will care for us and will protect us from the evil one. So first we saw Paul's illustration of honorable vessels who avoid the wicked ways of the false teachers. Next, we see the group of exhortations Paul gave to help avoid the traps of the evil ones. He, gives a, he rattles off a bunch of imperatives again. Here we go. More commands. Are we okay with the commands? Yes, we're okay only by the grace of God. And because Christ set us free, we now love Him, right? And we want to serve Him. And here are the exhortations in verse 22. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness... Faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Lots of commands here. Lots of things we're supposed to do. He talks about what we must flee from and what Timothy should pursue fully and what we must refuse. Let's look at these. What we must flee from. First, youthful lusts. Or you could say youthful passions or youthful desires. I think this isn't just referring to sensual ideas. The context points to something more. It, it, It points to the concept of what it's like to be a youth, a young person, and the desires that are associated with a young person. In fact, the context points to this, these as normal passions or desires that young believers are vulnerable to. I love the way Kent Hughes describes what he thinks these youthful passions are in light of the context. He says this, youthful passions or youthful desires or youthful lusts are the following, these three in particular. Impatience, harshness, and contentiousness. Impatience, harshness, and contentiousness. Or wanting to debate or argue. Those are the things that he talks about. It makes sense in the context. What does he call us to do? Be patient, to be kind, 
to not be argumentative. That's what he's talking about in this whole section. Now, okay, let's all be real. Would you say that when you were younger, say in your, I know some of you in the room, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. In your late teens, early 20s, you were the most patient person in the world. And you were never harsh. You were, you, you know, you just had a way of being gentle and kind and loving. And you never wanted to argue. See, I don't know about you, but if you were to compare that list to me when I was a youth, unfortunately, that is me. I was impatient, I was argumentative, and I was harsh. And sadly, I'm still working on many of those. <laughs> Not like I've arrived. But in order to deal with false teachers and false teaching, we must be patient. We must be gentle. We must be not argumentative. By the way, they can be besetting sins for all of us, even the elderly. You understand that, right? We must flee these youthful passions if we are to honor God when dealing with false teachers. The safeguard from false doctrine and resulting evil behavior is fleeing sinful desires and passions and pursuing a God-honoring desire. Notice, next, Paul explains what the follower of Christ should pursue. Not being argumentative, harsh, contentious, but we should pursue pure righteousness. God's way of living. His moral direction. Pursue faith. That is total dependence upon God. Now again, I want you to think about this and we're going to apply this as we go down through it. You'll see it fits perfect and he applies it in the last section when he characterizes those that are able to rebuke a false teacher and correct a false teacher. There's pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace. Well, righteousness is God's moral way, His direction. Faith is total dependence upon God. Love is commitment evidenced by unconditional sacrifice. Commitment evidenced by unconditional sacrifice towards others. And peace. This is the idea of not being at war. Wanting to be be able to have a discussion without battling and fighting and throwing barbs. Verbal barbs. This is just like Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with some men. All men, all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So, what is Timothy, what are we supposed to pursue in order to deal with false teachers and the wickedness that they promote? We must be pursuing righteousness. We must be pursuing faith. We must be pursuing love. We must be pursuing peace. And this fits, doesn't it? If you're talking to somebody that is antagonistic and wanting you to argue and wanting to fight with you, what do you need to do? Pursue righteousness. You need to depend upon the Lord. You need to trust Him. You need to actually love the person you're talking to. What? I can't love false teachers. What does the Bible say? Love your enemies. Because after all, that's what God did for us. He loved us even though we were what? Sinners. His enemies. We need to love. And we need to seek to be at peace with all men. Now... I know some of you are in the room that's saying, well, you're sounding just like Joel Osteen. No, 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 no. That doesn't mean that we don't correct them. 
It doesn't mean that we don't rebuke them. It doesn't mean that we don't call out the truth. But it's how we do it. And it's the heart behind how we do it. And it's the motives behind what we're saying and doing. That's important. If it's about me, then I've lost. It's a youthful passion. Because listen, I love to argue in my flesh. And that will be what? Useless. I won't be sanctified. And I won't be used by the master to do good works. Beloved, we must pursue these things. We don't, we don't want to fight. We don't want to argue. We want peace. Public displays of pride and anger do not create peace. I know we live in a world where everybody is prideful. But we are supposed to be sanctified, set apart, pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Wrangling wrangling over useless topics, not even really concerned with the gospel, is useless. If you're always looking for a fight, you should be concerned. Oh, I've heard this before. I'm just being honest. I've dealt, I've dealt with the college group. I'm telling you, we've had conversations, and there have been times where I'm like, what are we doing? And at the end of the discussion, they say, man, I just love a good fight. Oh, so we just promoted your youthful passion? Oh, beloved, we can't fall into that trap. You say, well, then I'll be boring. No, then you'll be useful to the master. It's not about an argument. It's about a soul. It's about a soul that could end up in hell. And we should take that serious. Satan's prodding you. Oh, you're good with words. Give it to him. If that's your motive, there's a problem. We must pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace. And he will make you think It's Satan, that is. Satan will make you think you're a hero when in fact you're just being lured into his trap. We, who are God's own, must pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord. We must partner with those that have that same goal, that same ambition, that same motive. We must partner with those that are called by God, His children. We must partner with them to pursue righteousness, peace, and love, and faith. Then the last exhortation, look what we must refuse. He says, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. Oh, I am convinced. Have you all noticed this? False teaching, and they, they, again, they're just reworked lies from previously, but false teaching is often very speculative. They come up with some new twist or new angle. It's philosophical often. It's this idea that man's philosophies start to get in and they kind of creep down in there and let's talk about this. And before you know it, you're discussing and arguing about something that isn't even in the Bible. And you're spending hours upon hours upon hours arguing over how many angels can sit on the head of a needle. You say, oh, well, that sounds stupid. Oh, beloved, how many people in the past 
that would look at our arguments today and say, oh, y'all are, y'all are foolish. Why are you arguing about that? This is how the enemy gets in. We must not, we must not fall into these traps. We must refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. This literally means uneducated and uninstructed investigations. The idea, the Greeks were all about philosophy and investigating philosophies. But they were ignorant speculations. The philosophies of men. Friends, if the Bible isn't our primary source of our wisdom, then we are vulnerable to disaster. We can be the smartest people in all the world and be totally foolish. We can have all these philosophies and be able to argue with the best of them and at the end of the day be a complete, what? Lost soul. We must refuse the philosophies of men. As Colossians 2.8 states, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the word or of the world, rather than according to Christ. Do you get that? Do you understand? Philosophies are coming. It's being pitched to you all the time. Did you know that? You watch TV or you go on internet, you watch YouTube, you do any of these things, you're being promoted and told philosophies of men. It's being pushed on you constantly, all the time. We must avoid these things. But then I won't be cutting edge, I won't be cool. You'll be boring, and you'll live forever. In eternity, we find joy and glory in the simple, pure gospel message. I think it's important that I, this message, I don't get super excited because I want you to get the point that even if it's on this level here, it's still good if it's the Word of God. I don't have to scream and get loud and be out really loud for it to be an important message. If it's what the Word says, that's what we have to believe. Ultimately, we must refuse getting into useless debates with men. Why? It says it in the passage. Knowing that they produce quarrels. They produce fights. So we avoid the wicked ways of the false teachers by understanding and applying the illustration of the vessels. And by obeying the exhortations from the scriptures. And finally, we see the final aspect of dealing with false teachers, the characterization. I love this section of scripture. I fail to do it as much as I want to, but this is how I want to be characterized. And if there was one thing that I could have on my tombstone, it would be this. This is what my ministry, this is what I want my ministry to look like. This is how I want to be characterized. This is how pastors should be characterized. This is it. This is ministry. And I think Paul is telling Timothy specifically, this is how you should be characterized. Who we are is often one of the greatest defenses against the lies of the enemy. What character traits do we display in a pressure cooker world demonstrates a lot about us. Here we see it. Look at verse 24. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. 
Paul lays out here clearly how the shepherd of God's flock should look. This is just like in another 1 Timothy 3 where the qualifications of an elder are given. Well, here's a qualification of a pastor, a qualification of an elder. Here it is right here. Now, just to be clear, the first application of this passage is for the shepherds. It's for the elders. It's for those that are leading. And I think that's seen in the able to teach phrase. It's the same concept that's used over in 1 Timothy 3. Those who are correcting the evil ones are the Lord's bondservant able to teach. Very important. And I want you to take note of this. I've heard once before, um, Jehovah Witnesses come to your door and they knock on your door and you say, no, I don't talk to you and you slam the door. And I've heard people say, well, that's horrible. Don't do that. Well, there is an element of that that you shouldn't be rude to them. I agree with you there. But I also, you also must understand, we all must, must understand this, that maturity does matter in how you're discussing and if you're discussing something with a false teacher. If you're not mature in the faith and you haven't been studying your Bible, you better be a little bit more careful. God has established it this way, that those that are the leaders and the teachers are the ones that are supposed to be out in front. Taking the battle to the enemy. Now that also doesn't mean that you should just use that as an excuse to never talk to anybody. So again, I have to give all these caveats to make sure that we don't fall into a trap and y'all don't misread me, okay? But here we can see that the main correctors are the Lord's bondservants. I think it's talking in context of those who are able to teach, those who are the leaders and the shepherds. But it applies, all these truths apply to even all of y'all. It applies secondarily. And they fit. And we should all be trying to be characterized this way, shouldn't we? Just for, the, just for sake of an argument, everybody that has children, by all means, you are shepherding somebody, aren't you? And you should look like this. I'm afraid, but... Maybe afterwards I'll ask my children, do I look like this? Am I characterized like this all the time? They would say, no, Dad, not all the time. Just being truthful. But this is the direction of our lives. Now, just to be clear, this is first for the flock, uh, shepherds, but then secondarily to y'all. Notice the shepherd is the Lord's bondservant. He must not be, we must not be our own. It must not, our lives must not be about us. We are now His. We are the Lord's. We are owned by God. He is my master. I am His slave. I am His possession. And I'm good with that. Because I have a good master, a loving Lord. And we should look like his slaves. And we should be characterized as his slaves. What do his slaves look like? Well, Christ's slaves are not quarrelsome. We must not be quarrelsome. Not one who likes to get into verbal battles and arguments. We can't be that person that's always looking for a fight or always looking for an argument. We must be that person that's looking to kind of put things down and, and, and not fight all the time. Keep things from getting bent out of shape. Thankfully, God's grace provides the abilities to do this for God's slaves. Second, it, we must be kind to all. We must be kind to all. You know what the word in the Greek for kind means? You ready? Kind. Yeah, kind. We're supposed to be kind. A kind person is a friendly person, a considerate person, a generous person. 
Somebody that actually respects other people and shows honor to them. That's a kind person. You know, somebody that holds the door for a lady. <gasps> yeah, it shows kindness for somebody else, a kind person. If we're abrasive or rude or hateful or disrespectful, we're not kind. That makes sense, doesn't it? We're not characterized by kindness, then we're not showing that we are the Lord's bond slave. We must be able to teach. Again, this is an ability that does not come from ourselves only. It's a God-given gift from God. But this able to teach, just a, a side note on this, is not something that uh, doesn't take practice. It takes work. It takes study, and it takes discipline, and it takes practice, and it takes blowing it numerous times. I'm sorry, y'all are my practice, often. I'm doing this, and doing this, and doing this, and doing this, and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that you put up with the numerous times I mess up. The flubbing of the words, y'all know what I'm talking about, those foolish things I say, like, you know, Paul would have been on Facebook or something. Foolish stuff. Thank you for putting up with me. Help us. Pray for us. Please pray for your pastors, your shepherds, that we will be faithful to your word, able to teach. We must be patient when wronged. Oh, I love this. Patient when wronged. This means we bear up under evil and mistreatment without resentment or bitterness or spite. Ooh. Patient when wronged. When somebody mistreats us, we don't get that little, I'm not going to talk to that person anymore, forget you. We can take it when somebody says something rough to us and not be destroyed. Listen, folks, if you're going to deal with false teachers and you're going to talk to them, they're going to do what? They're going to insult you. They're going to mistreat you. They're going to do everything they can to get under your skin. Why? Because if they get under your skin, you will demonstrate impatience. You will demonstrate an ungodlike behavior. And then what will they do? They'll hold that up. See? See, you just don't really get it. See, if you really got it, you'd be holy like me. Do you understand? This is what happens with the false teacher. So we can't hold on to bitterness. We must not allow evil to totally destroy us. Now, just a warning for all of you. If you want to go headlong in and fight a bunch of false teachers, you better be characterized this way or you're going to fall. So you say, well, I'm not. What do I do? Fall on your face and cry out to God and ask him for grace and pursue righteousness, pursue Christ, and he will give you that grace. Notice it says we must correct the opposition to the truth with gentleness. The word for gentleness in the Greek literally means this. It's cool. A quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own importance. You hear me? This whole idea of correcting those with gentleness is a, a quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own importance and knowledge. And when I saw gentleness, I thought, well, just another word for kind. But it literally means... Look, if you're dealing with somebody that's a false teacher and you're think, you think you know it all and you're all that and you're important, you're not ready. Don't talk to them. Run. Now, that doesn't mean that you go in whimpering in and say, hey, well, I don't know anything. I'm here to learn from you. That's not what that means. It means... That you should not have a false sense of your own importance and your own knowledge. 
Simple, don't go into a fight prideful. Because if you're going to correct somebody and you have pride in your heart, you're doomed. Is this good? We can learn a lot from this, can't we? We're vulnerable of having a correct truth, but presenting it in a wrong way. Every one of us in the room, there is nobody that's not vulnerable of this. But, and I want you to take note of this in the verses, we do correct. The word correct is we do educate, we instruct, we teach. We teach others, even false teachers. We rebuke, even false teachers. We correct, even false teachers. Why, though? Why do we do it? Why do we do it? In this verse, the primary reason is for their conversion. Really? Why do I correct false teachers? Why do I correct those that are in opposition to the truth? So that they will repent and believe in Jesus. And their souls won't end up in hell forever. That's why we do it. How do I know? Because it says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Now, there's an important note here, just like we talked about in Sunday school today. There's the general call and the effectual call, right? The general call to the false teacher is repent and believe in the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That's the general call to every one of them. We correct them. We educate with them. We instruct them. They're going the opposite direction of which way they should go. And we do it with gentleness, kindness, humility, love, concern. And we do it Trusting in God to do the effectual calling. Because it's up to God to do it. If perhaps God may grant them repentance. Where, who gives repentance, beloved? God does. Is it my job? Nope, that's not my job. My job is not to grant repentance. I don't really want that job. That's God's. My job is to lovingly, graciously, kindly, humbly correct those who are in opposition to the truth. And God works by His grace in that, in me, to accomplish that. I can't do it by myself either. But then by His grace, He, if perhaps God, may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. You know, I love this. Because there's, there's such a beautiful, uh, comforting thing for a pastor to have in his soul if he knows these verses. These are the most comforting verses in all the world. Because it takes the responsibility of changing people out of my hands. It's not my job to fix everybody in the room. Did you hear me? Oh, this is that good news. <laughs> That's great news. <laughs> I don't have to fix everybody. All I have to do is obey my master and proclaim the truth in a gracious and kind way, humbly depending upon him, and he'll do the rest. He does, he does the converting when he wants to. And what if they get angry? Well, then he, in his ordained will, what? Wanted them to get angry. And what should I do? Not return revile for revile, not have any bitterness in my soul. Say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. I love you. I really do love you. And not take it personal. Because it's God that they're rejecting. Not me. And really, it doesn't matter if they reject me because I'm just a human like them. The saddest thing is is that they're rejecting God. And notice, notice who they are ensnared by. 
I know we talk about free will all the time. We've heard the arguments of whether there's free will or not. Well, this this verse looks like there's no freedom of the will. Because look at the end. It says, having been held captive by him to do his will. Hmm. Seems as though the world is held captive by Satan to do his will. The unbeliever is not free. They're controlled by who? Satan. To do his will. Freedom to obey God and serve Him is found by His grace in Christ when He grants repentance. There's our hope. Are you encouraged, beloved? I'm encouraged by this passage. Will you do me one huge, huge favor? This is one thing I ask. I want you to pray this week for your elders, for us, your pastors. We want to look like this. I want to look like this all the time. And I have to admit, I still have some youthful passions I'm killing. My pride still slips in there. Some of y'all have seen it before. Especially my kids, sadly. Will you pray for your pastors? And then when you're finished praying for us, will you pray for yourself? That you will look like this. And that we will all look like the Lord's slaves. Not quarrelsome, but kind to all. Able to teach. Patient when wronged. With gentleness correcting those in opposition. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great truth. We pray, Father, that you will help us to be characterized like this to obey the exhortations that you've given us in, to be an illustration of the honorable vessels who are cleansed and put off false teaching and put off the word wicked ways and we're sanctified and useful for you, our master. Thank you for this church, God. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord. Please help us to walk with you. We can do nothing, none of this without your grace. We are totally dependent upon you. We thank you for Christ Jesus who came into the world to die for sinners like us and rose from the dead to give us life in him. Help us, Father, now to serve you faithfully. We pray this in Jesus' name.